Oh, All right. Hello, everyone. Kevin, with our dog school, Kevin, uh, today. We're talking about basically how to help your dog with some scary situations. Yesterday, I released a new blog post, which kind of broke some of that down. I want to talk a little bit about that today and just kind of go through some different scenarios where if your dog is afraid, how you can sort of help them. <clears throat> in some situations, you're going to be kind of stuck. It's like, hey, I got to we're stuck in this moment. What do we do? So like, what, what is the best way to manage? Uh, and then another scenario would be uh, like planning ahead of time. So like, oh, OK, so I know that my dog you know, struggles with cars on walks. What do I do? So having a game plan is very, very helpful. If you have any questions or any sort of scenarios that you're trying to work through, feel free to leave them in the comments and I will see them and try to address them. So there's a couple different ways that you can work on helping your dog through these scenarios. There's a way that involves asking for your dog to do certain behaviors. And then there's another way that just focuses on building an association. So turning the scary thing into something that's not so scary. So let's start off by talking about that. The first thing would be to change a scary thing into something that's not so scary. The way that I like to help clients is by using a process called desensitization and counter conditioning. You don't have to remember the terminology, but what that basically means is you turn the scary thing into a predictor of something that your dog loves and the des desensitization aspect of it means that you're not, you're, you're essentially controlling the intensity of it. And distance is my favorite tool to use when trying to control the intensity of something. So what this would look like is <clears throat> you're walking with your dog, your dog notices the scary thing. I use the example of cars in the blog post that I wrote. So your dog sees cars and your dog, maybe your dog's reaction due to fear is to bark and lunge at cars. So one, one thing we can do is change that association. And then the side effect of changing that association is the behavior changes. And then the other thing that I'll talk about is you can actually ask for more appropriate behaviors. That will work if you're doing it correctly. Both, both will work if you're doing it correctly. So let's break it down. To change that association, you need to focus on a couple things. Probably the most important thing is you have to have something that your dog would do backflips for. This thing, let's just, let's pick a, let's pick something for the example, let's call it chicken. So your dog loves chicken, would do backflips for chicken. It's very important that your dog does not get chicken other times. We have to save it for this scenario. So we, let's say we've got that. We've, we're armed and ready with our high value food, our chicken. When you have that in place, what you're able to then do is turn, I'm gonna use the car example, turn the car into a predictor of that high value thing. So early on, when you're walking and your dog sees that car, their brain is initially going to go with, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. As the car gets closer, that nervousness will probably explode into a barking and lunging, again, if that's what happens with your dog. So what we will do is, as you're walking your dog and as your dog notices the car, you would start to give your dog that high value food, the chicken that I mentioned. So car now predicts high value food chicken. There, a, a common uh, comment, common comment is that, hey, I've tried food and it doesn't work. It's not working. If that is something that, you know, you've, you've said that before or you've tried food and it has not worked, there's a couple things. One, the food may not be valuable enough. So it's a motivation thing. Two, the intensity of the scary thing is just too high. So it's too intense. So ultimately that car is passing right next to you. Think about yourself. If you're walking on a street and a car passes you slowly and kind of goes around you and gives you some space, not very scary for you, right? If you're walking on the side of the street because there's no sidewalks and a car whizzes right by you, no matter who you are, you're going to go like, oh, whew, thanks. You know, that's going to scare you. So there's different levels of intensity. If I were to offer you an ice cream cone or something when that car nearly clips you, you might be too stressed, too upset to actually take that. Whereas if I offered you an ice cream cone when a car went around you in the other lane, you'd probably gladly take it. And then with the repetition, when cars go around you, you might start to have that happy association that we're talking about. So intensity plays a role in it. So if you're finding that you're in a situation where your dog's not eating, you're probably too close to the scary thing and you need to add some distance. And that kind of goes along with the desensitization thing that I had mentioned before. So building these associations, 
high value food, we have to control the intensity. So again, if it's too intense, your dog is not going to be able to respond. Just like if you were afraid of something and somebody's asking you, asking you a question, you're not gonna be able to respond. It's just too intense. So there you go. Now that you have your high value food and we know what the scary thing is, it's important that we focus on turning the scary thing into the predictor of the awesome thing. So a common mistake, and this is anytime I work with clients, this mistake is almost always taking place when people have attempted this sort of stuff. They have tried, here comes the car, they've tried starting to feed their dog. I'm feeding my dog here. And it's almost to just distract my dog from seeing the car. Sometimes people have some success with that, especially early on, because I have chicken, eat the chicken, eat the chicken, eat the chicken. My dog is really focused on the chicken. But what can happen is one of two things. That management device, uh, situation may always work. Maybe the chicken's just valuable enough. My dog is focused on the chicken, doesn't focus on the car. So if I do it every single time, I'm okay, I'm good. But the time that I don't do it, my dog is focused on the car. So, so it possibly would work every time if you did it every time. The other thing that can occur and is very common, I've got my dog here and I hear or see the car coming and before my dog is paid att paying attention, I get my dog's attention, I start feeding him. If that car ends up scaring my dog, what I'm doing, offering food before the dog appears, could become a predictor to my dog that a scary car is coming. And in the future, they may say, oh, I know what's happening here. That food predicts the scary car. So we have to have a correct order of events. You'll also want to do this every single time. And I'm going to use the example that I mentioned uh, in my blog post yesterday. This involved me and my kids and my wife were walking and I had my kids in my wagon and a person and their dog were walking by. We we're on the street and the dog looked over at the wagon, was a little excited. The person went, yes, or good. I forget exactly what the person had said. The dog turned around, got a treat and so on and so forth. Repeated that a couple of times. What happened there? Well, I can tell you that probably in the past, the dog was most likely nervous about kids or wagons or something. And my guess would be that the dog would bark and lunch. I obviously don't know the past, but I'm just guessing. Um, and so now what she has done is started to turn the wagon and kids and predictors of high value food. And so the dog was able to look and look back on its own and she developed a new behavior. So if you simply just feed for when that car comes or whenever the scary thing is comes, if you're consistent and you're controlling the intensity enough, it's highly likely that your dog will start to notice the scary thing, the car, the wagon, whatever it is, and your dog will start to look back at you. And then you'll be able to feed your dog for that. And you'll, you'll, you'll actually be kind of building a new behavior. So that's how the association stuff can work. And there's more to it, more to it, but I just wanted to break it down a little bit. So you can build associations with the scary things. What you can also do is simply just teach behaviors. Now, you'll still need food for this. You need to reward the behaviors to get them to happen more frequently. So you need food for it. You're going to need a high value food as well. So let's keep using the chicken example. So you've got your chicken on you. You're walking your dog. And I'm going to hold my dog because I need to have him visible. Walk my dog. My dog notices the car coming. That could be my cue to use a verbal marker or a clicker or something to that effect. I could say good or yes. So this is similar to what happened with the wagon yesterday, uh, the other day too. My dog notices the car. I say, yes, good boy. He turns back and looks, I feed him and repeat. So I could do like a look at that exercise or instead of just saying good or yes, I could actually ask for behavior. So he looks at the car. I say, watch. He looks up at me. I feed him. He looks at the car. I say, watch. He looks up at me. I feed him. And so you're working it more in a ask for behavior sort of thing. So look at that as essentially saying, hey, when you do look, something good is gonna happen for you um, and you mark it. And then eventually dogs will kind of jump it and what they'll do is they'll see it and look back at you before you even do anything, which is awesome because then you're not worrying about barking and lunging. You're not necessarily worrying about the fear aspect of it. Uh, so, so that's kind of a way to look at it. If you're going to ask for behaviors, you still need to have the correct order. And what I mean by that is you want to wait for your dog to actually see the car first or whatever the scary thing is then ask for the behavior, then reward. With that repetition, your dog will eventually start to notice it, and I've already sort of mentioned this, but your dog will start to notice the car, look back at you, and reward. 
And then everything kind of falls into place. So it's really cool because then you're just walking and instead of your dog going, oh, car, your dog's going, hey, car, hey, did you see that? Where's my treat? That means you have successfully changed the association, at least in that context, and you uh, have a new behavior. So that's what's really cool. So those, that's kinda, uh, those are a couple things that you can do. Here's a couple things that you don't wanna do, or at least one thing you don't wanna do. If my dog's a little nervous of something, whether it be a car, a person, a dog, let's say my dog starts to bark and lunge, and the goal with the barking and lunging is my dog is trying to communicate, hey, I want you to go away. I wouldn't wanna give any sort of correction for that behavior. If I were to say, hey, don't do that, what am I teaching my dog? Well, one, it is possible that I could decrease barking and lunging because he has learned that if I bark and lunge, I get a, a nasty correction. So it could potentially decrease the behavior. But what is highly likely to happen is your dog is going to start to build an association that when a scary thing starts coming, a correction is also about to come, which is going to help develop an even uh, further negative association or, or maybe there wasn't a negative association there before, but now there is. So that's something to take into consideration. So don't do any sort of corrections. It will increase fear. Um, it could decrease behaviors, uh, which also means that you could just be shutting your dog down and that's not very helpful. Again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments or if you're watching this after it's posted, feel free to leave a comment and I will check back and answer for you. So anything that's frightening your dog, your goal would be to turn the scary thing into a predictor of awesome stuff. And then the biggest factor or one of the biggest factors is controlling the intensity. So if your dog is afraid of the garbage disposal in your house, maybe I'm at my kitchen sink, garbage disposal is right in front of me and my dog is right there. Maybe I turn that garbage disposal on and my dog heads for the hills. Maybe that makes me feel terrible. I don't want my dog to be afraid of that sort of thing. So let's, let's condition it, right? Let me turn on that, that garbage disposal and then I can feed my dog. Well, in theory, that could work because I'm saying, hey, garbage disposal is on. You're going to get some tasty chicken. But garbage disposal is too intense and my dog starts running for the hills. He may not eat. He might say, get that food away from me. That thing is it's, it's going to kill me. So we figure out a first step where your dog can be successful. Perhaps my dog would be successful if I brought him into a room, shut the door, we're hanging out in there. And then my wife turns on the garbage disposal and then he's like, oh, I hear that. And then I start feeding him, that could be my first step. Do that a few days in a row. Before you know it, that garbage disposal turns on, my dog gets happy. Then I'd be ready for my second step, which would probably be, an example would be open that door, stay in that room. And then what ends up happening is he hears it louder, but it's not so scary still at the distance. Shelly, would you say Theo still uses this method? Thanks to you and all your training. Shelly, give Theo a treat for me. Shelly, by the way, I have an Akita that lives next door to me who reminds me of Theo a little bit and she is so lovely and it makes me miss him even more. But I'm glad to have uh, Lola next door because she's, she's fun. So whatever it is, figure out, okay, where can I start? If it's the vacuum cleaner, if it's uh, garbage disposal, likely, uh, the most likely thing is you're going to have your dog in another room with the door shut and you are going to have a second person turn it on. There's a lot of steps to this sort of stuff. Here's an example. If I were to three days in a row bring my dog into that room, garbage disposal turns on and I feed my dog, I do want to make sure that my dog is building the association with the garbage disposal and not just going into the room. So I would want to mix in bringing my dog into the room, shutting the door, hanging out for a minute or two, and then him and I exiting, therefore, it's not, okay, we're in the room. That means this good thing is gonna happen, right? So you kind of do some of those as well, just to make sure that your dog is building the association with the actual thing you're trying to do. And another thing is you have to make sure that food is not right in your dog's face. I don't have any food out with right now, but let's say my pen is a, is a dog treat. I wouldn't want to have this thing out in front of him. I just grabbed it. Now my dog is thinking about food. Now he and I go into the room together. Now garbage disposal goes off and he gets the food. I actually have the wrong order of events. And what that means is my dog is blinded by the food. If I'm actually at a level that's too intense, then me doing all this, he's gonna to start to get sort of shut down and go, oh, you've got that food. That means you're gonna bring me in that room and the scary thing's gonna happen. So the order of events is very important. So there you go. There's some uh, relatively quick info. Any questions, please reach out and let me know and I will answer for you. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a good day, bye.